Hello, everyone. Welcome to Talking Logistics, where we have conversations with thought leaders and newsmakers in the supply chain logistics industry. And it's my great pleasure to welcome to today's program Greg Johnson, who's CMO at GT Nexus. And today we're going to talk about the promised land of hyperconnected and synchronized supply chains. Now, this is a promised land that many companies have kind of embarked on, you know, for, for many, many years and are still on that journey and haven't quite gotten there yet. So we're going to talk about some of the reasons why, perhaps, you know, uh, that's been such a difficult journey for some companies and what some companies have done to kind of get closer, you know, to there. So very, very excited to have Greg on today and, and, and talk about this, this timely and, and important topic. I uh, just want to remind you, if you're joining us live uh, today, that if you do want to ask a question, uh, you can do so via the submit a question button or the uh, chat feature. And uh, if, if it's a good and appropriate question, we can certainly try to weave it into the, uh, into the conversation. Uh, you do have to sign in as a as a uh, if you are joining us as a visitor, you do have to sign in first before you can submit a question. Uh, with that, Greg, welcome to the program. Thank you, Adrian. Good to be here. So, Greg, you know, uh, kind of feeding off what I just said right now, you, you know, I've often said that you know obtaining timely, accurate, and complete supply chain visibility has been and continues to be kind of the most elusive goal for companies. Uh, why do you think that's still the case? Well, it's. Um, I, I think it is one of the core capabilities that companies need. And um, you know, when you talk about visibility, it is about visibility to so much of the transactional data that 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 occurs between companies or that gets generated by partners outside your outside your company. And you know, fundamentally, a lot of that data is um, is data that is generated in a proprietary format. It might be generated in a system that is unlike your system. So the big challenge, the big barrier for a lot of companies has been a data challenge. It's about how to get data out of the systems of partners. And we're not talking about two partners or three partners. We're talking about hundreds or thousands. So um, that exercise of getting lots of very detailed transactional data, we're talking about order status information and shipment status information and inventory location information and the um, the the rigor that you need to apply to get to good high quality data has just been a very very tough challenge for companies and so I, I would say you know yes there are process challenges yes there are social challenges you've got to convince your network and your partners to um, to work with you and you know get on board and generate data and connect with you but there's a fundamental technology challenge, which is how do you translate that data? How do you synthesize it? H how do you turn it into meaningful information that you can act on to run your, your business? Yeah, you know, we, we continue to see that, uh, uh, that, that challenge. Even just recently in the news, I mean, over the past week, I've written uh, a couple of blog posts highlighting some recent news where, you know, one case it was Home Depot talking about, uh, you know, a new customer order management system they put in place. And during the earnings call, they talked about how they were still with some of their suppliers still transmitting orders via fax machines, right? And then, uh, you know, in more recent news this week, uh, uh, you know, Reuters had an article about Target and some of the uh, data challenges that they had in terms of, of, of uh, poor data quality that was impacting their, their logistics processes. You know, so so you know, let's, let's talk about this connectivity thing because I think uh, you know I agree with you that kind of you know when you have so much data and information across so many systems, across uh, so many trading partners, across so many geographies, it does. In addition to all the other challenges, it is a, a technology you know challenge as well in terms of trying to get all that data you know together. But you know, at the one end, you know, you still have companies like I said that are using fax machines and phone calls to to exchange information with their trading partners. At the other end, you, you have companies that are using, you know, EDI, which is technology has been around for a very long time, but but it's been mainly used between the large trading partners. So, you know, when we talk about hyper connected supply chains, how do you, how do companies actually get there? I mean, how do they reach that promised land? Well, I think we're at we're at a place now in um, in history in technology in, in the evolution of technology where we finally have a way to make that happen. You know, and it's not just a question of connecting electronically with your partners. You know, we, we have had EDI and we have had software that you can buy and you can install to translate the many EDI feeds that you get from partners. So if you're looking for a shipment status update, which in the world of logistics is a EDI 315 message for ocean and it's a 214 message for, 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 for air freight, um, that 
that technology has been around. And so, but what you ended up, ended up with was a lot of separate integrations with hundreds of partners. And every partner speaks a different language. And the real thing that's happened is that we now have cloud platforms and technology that treat that communication between companies not as a one-to-one -one connection, but as a many-to-many -many platform that's not unlike social networks. So if you look at how Facebook operates or LinkedIn operates, where you have a profile, and it's in the cloud. And you know we're not exchanging electronically with each other over Facebook, per se. We're using the user interface, and we're interacting that way. But the information model is when you make a change to your profile, you make it once in one place in the cloud, and everybody in the network gets the news automatically at light speed. And that's what's happening in business. That's what's happening now between companies. So what you have is companies who are connecting to a single platform and driving their information there where the, where the information, the data gets translated once for everybody who cares and retranslated back into the systems of everybody around that network. So it's an information model. You're not making thousands of connections. You're making one connection. And the smarts for translating and synthesizing your data into, into a super language that anybody can consume is the real thing that's solving this. So you know, as you, as you move to hyper-connected supply chains, that that's that's fundamental you know that's what basically makes the data possible so you know if you if you agree that data is the new oil that you can't really run your business unless you can gather the data from around it and put it in one place that you can exercise and act on then that that shift that that big innovation to sort of move to a cloud platform that looks more like a social network or at least it behaves in that way was really the thing that transformed it so i think you know connectivity has always been a challenge and people have invested heavily in it and they, they, they've invested heavily in EDI, and their EDI standards. Yet despite all of that, most companies can't see well. They can't really get to the information they need. You know, we estimate something like 80% of the data that you need to, ex to execute in your supply chain is manufactured or held or managed beyond your four walls. Most companies have just 20% of it. So you need a platform that's going to synthesize the data from across hundreds of partners, put it in one place, and then you can begin to get to orchestration and process automation, the things that really will improve your business. You know, there's a couple of things there that I want, I want to kind of dive into a little bit more. I mean, one is, you know, you talked about, I mean, companies have made, a lot of companies have made a lot of investments in EDI. I mean, when you talk about these new platforms, and I, I tend to call them supply chain operating networks, and, and, and I, I, obviously I'm a big advocate of it. I've written a lot about it over the, over the, the years, so I, I am, you know, quote unquote biased, you know, towards that model, so I, I'll be upfront about that. But, but then there's also the reality that companies have invested a lot of EDI. I mean, how does, so if you are using EDI, how, how do you take advantage of the, these newer cloud platforms or supply chain operating networks? Is it, does it replace them? Does it, is it a question of leveraging your existing investments within these platforms? You know, what, 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 are, what are companies doing today in that area? Well, it, in some ways, there is an element that is a wholesale shift or wholesale swap out. You know, um, but on the other hand, you know, if you're a company that has made lots of investment in EDI connectivity, you've already done a lot of the, there, there's so much more that has to happen. So the work of tying together your own systems to an outside integrated feed, for one thing, um, any of the master data management work that you might have done inside your company to accommodate connections with partners is probably a path you've embarked on already and you're far along. Um, the, the, the social experience of, of trying to work with outside third parties who have their own agendas and their other customers and other partners they have to work with. So the, the muscle memory that you develop in, in, in working with outside parties to get that done, all that is a core competency that you can leverage in this next domain. You know, that doesn't go away. In fact, you've got a good running start at it. So, you know, um, the mechanisms, you, you, what will happen is you begin to switch over to this newer technology, these newer platforms, and you're moving a little faster than the companies that haven't made investments sooner. And then you just accelerate. You know, I think that's because the data and the connectivity, at the end of the day, it's plumbing. You know, it's, it, in of itself, it's not super exciting. It's really necessary, really hard to do. It's been incredibly hard to do. But once that's behind you, you move on to the next thing, which is now you begin to uh, automate processes, the, the transactions like order fulfillment or doing sophisticated supply chain maneuvers like 
customer direct shipments or DC bypass or th these are things that all of a sudden become possible because you've got a strong solid foundation of data underneath you and even the best companies even the companies that made massive investments in EDI still don't have any, anything close to in, in our view a solid foundation of data it's been an expensive hard brittle uh, experience and that's why supply chain visibility to go, to go back to your opening remarks is still one of the top top challenges and top needs for companies you know so we're at a we're at a watershed moment i think in in supply chain history and in technology history which is suddenly there are ways and mechanisms and technologies to help companies get to a hyper connected supply chain network state you know, I think the other thing, and I agree with those points, I think the other thing that's interesting that's perhaps a little bit more different today or perhaps more important today, you know, is the reality that, you know, when I talk to supply chain executives, they talk about their, their biggest challenge being keeping up with the rapid pace of change. And, and we all know that, that supply chain management is really all about exception management, right? Nothing ever really goes according to plan. And, you know, generally speaking, you know, EDI systems are about computers talking to computers and in a lot of cases, there are bulk transactions. Uh, there's a lot of latency built into the system. But the, the, the real challenge is you know, managing exceptions or being able to, to uh, uh, accelerate the flow of information to deal with you know, changes to the plan and, and so forth. And I think that's the opportunity where some of these newer platforms have you know, an advantage, if you will, or, or are able to address that reality better with the, the fact that you, you know, except, exceptions uh, are, are the norm in supply chain management and dealing with those exceptions kind of requires a different approach to uh, getting data and communicating data and information, um, you know, between trading partners much more quickly than, um, you, you know, EDI systems have historically uh, enabled. Do, do you agree with that? Uh, absolutely. It's, it's a great insight, Adrian. And I think in some ways what you're talking about is what I think of as a, a shift to uh, hyper execution you know the ability you, you can spend a lot of time planning and a lot of companies have built um, good systems good protocols good process for for planning I'm thinking about sales and operation planning I'm thinking about demand forecast ma managing the plan and, and create and developing the plan and optimizing the plan but if you look at the the, the, the state of companies today they're heavily outsourced they work in a global environment uh, it's a dynamic environment. The competition is incredibly intense. Competitors coming from all over. The customer pressure to, to, to deliver different products or slightly tweaked products or a different level of service, that's intense. So, you know, it's really become a game of how well you respond and how well, how fast, as you say, you can respond. And the environment changes, so you can't predict or plan your way out of that. You know, you, you need a plan, but the plan changes. You know, if you look at a if you look at an order, a, the, the, the typical purchase order in most industries, and I'm thinking now specifically of retail footwear and apparel, where 90% um, of the orders that get cut change. They change. You know, ship windows change, quantities change, uh, endpoints change. You know, you, you've got a demand spike, and all of a sudden, you've got to change the the destination of an order or the recipient of an order. So, you you know, it really is about being responsive and fast and that's where this notion of networks and fast exchange of information becomes super important you may not be able to replan everything but you want to give information to all the operators on the ground uh, you know across the value chain who are making decisions and by the way who have their own systems to make uh, to optimize and change and make decisions so it really becomes a game I think where companies become much more competent and heavily weighted in their ability to execute and respond. And it doesn't mean they're backing off planning, it just means that for every dollar that you spend on planning, or you might have spent on planning 10 years ago, you're gonna have to take that investment, that IT investment, and begin to push it towards faster collaboration, faster operational response. Because it's just, it, it, it's impossible now to, to tune that demand forecast a little bit better or get that plan a little bit stronger. So I, I agree with you. I think it's all about good execution, good response, and, and the information systems we're talking about were built for that. Well, well let's, let's talk about one of the things I hear a lot from, from companies whenever I get in this kind of discussion, you know, in terms of 
connectivity and you know uh, synchronizing your supply chain. And one of the things I hear is, uh, you know, we need to get our own house in order, right, before we can even think about our supply chain, right? Um, and I've come across a lot of you know supply chain executives who have um, you know tasked with quote unquote transformation projects. And, but most of those initiatives tend to be kind of internally focused, you know, that where they're looking to consolidate uh, different IT systems within their companies and, and standardize on a single ERP platform, for example. And that's kind of what they mean by transformation is really trying to, you know, create that common plat operating platform within their four walls, if you will. Um, so I, you know, on the one hand, I, I kind of see the valid argument, right? That hey, you know, how can we even think about you know doing a lot of this? "Quote unquote sexy supply chain stuff, uh, you know, and, and, and exchanging data if, if we don't even have our own in-house uh, systems in order and data in order." Um, but you know, I wonder is that is that a valid argument? I mean, would, do you hear the same argument? What's your what's your take on that kind of response from companies that say we've got to get our, our in-house uh, our house in order first before we kind of tackle the, the extended supply chain? It's <clears throat> it's a um it's definitely a dilemma. <laughs> you know, I think you put your, your finger right on it. I, you know, on the one hand, you know, that just seems to make sense. Why, why, why wouldn't we get our house in order first? Um, but I think it, 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 you can't, you no longer can wait to start looking out at the neighborhood. You know, yes, you're going to have, you're going to be working on your house for a long time. You know, these are 10 year, 20 year. Look, we've been at it for 30, 40 years. We've been building the transactional enterprise backbone to handle systems of record and automation inside our companies for a long time. But the world has changed. The world has changed. It's, you know, you look at the level of outsourcing and collaboration that has to happen to execute and operate as a company, and it's, it's radically different. So um, I don't think you can wait any longer to start embarking on technology and transformational initiatives that connect your house with your neighborhood. And, you know, um, I don't think, I also think, I'll just say that in some ways it doesn't have to be a split the baby sort of situation necessarily because I think supply chain overall needs more investment. You know, if you look at the corporate allocation um, and look at what companies spend on marketing or selling or any of the traditional spend allocation areas, supply chain is the future. You know, you look at the great supply chain companies. I mean, look at look at the most valuable company on the planet, Apple. Tim Cook is a supply chain executive, and that's a supply chain company. And you look at some of the great companies on the planet, they're supply chain companies. So, you know, I believe, I happen to believe that the future belongs to great supply chain companies. And so I think companies need to be investing more in supply chain overall, but they need to especially be looking at systems that connect them with their partners. And... And to your point, Adrian, no, I, I don't think you can any you, you can no longer look inward or just inward. You have to embark on initiatives that connect you with your suppliers and your third party logistics providers and your customers, by the way. I mean, the the, the, the road to customer growth and to customer differentiation and brand differentiation is supply chain. And so the systems that we're talking about are not systems of record, they're systems of engagement. And if you if you were to sort of make it really simple, I'd say we spent the last 30 or 40 years building systems of record to help us run our companies and record what has happened around our companies. And that recording is a little bit late. It's not always accurate, but we're very busy recording that picture and storing it. And the future is about, the, on the other side of the line, is about how to engage with the market. So um, that's that bright line, I think, is really what we're talking about. It looks like we we lost Adrian there um, with a little bit of technical difficulty, so I'll I'll continue down that track. You know, I'll, I'll, I I kind of know where he might be going with this, but um, you know that that framework that we were just talking about, which is on the one hand systems of record, systems that we use to manage operations inside our company, which would be manufacturing, accounts receivable, accounts payable, and on the other hand, what we now call systems of engagement. These are systems that, that you use to connect with outside trading partners and service providers. And, you know, they, they complement each other and they relate to each other. Because, um, you know, 
we're not just talking about how you engage, we're talking about the data and the information you get through those engagements and how um, you can fortify your systems of record. So for example, you may not have a very rich history um, or profile history around every order, every trade transaction that you've collected in your ERP system. But if you have a system of, of engagement, then you can complement um, you know, that whole system of record and fortify it, make it more valuable. So if you want to do advanced analytics, and it looks like Adrian's back, welcome Adrian. We switched places in the, in the grid here, so I'm on the left and you're on the right. But I was just wrapping up uh, that sort of framework discussion of systems of engagement versus systems of record and talking about how they complement each other. And I think the way to look at this now is we're no longer companies that have good, strong systems of record inside our companies. We're companies that have two things, systems of record and very strong systems of engagement that connect us with our networks. No, great, great. I apologize. I dropped off there for, for a few seconds, so I had to get my, myself back on, but, but I was able to hear you. Uh, the whole time, and I love that. Uh, I, I love that um, uh, terminology: systems of uh, record versus systems of engagement. And I want to get back to that discussion around, um, you know, investments. Uh, you know, in the in the in the question down the road. But but let me um, uh, before I get to that, um, you, you know, so, so let's talk now. When we talk about um, you know hyperconnected and synchronized supply chains. You know, what does the quote unquote to be state look like? In other words, you know, what are the attributes that companies ought to, you know, strive toward? Well, if you look at the top end, um, I don't think any of the, the traditional supply chain metrics go away. I mean, if, if you're tracking on time and in full, for example, in logistics for, for customer service, or you're looking to reduce first costs as a percentage, um, it, or reduce inventory or accelerate turns. These all stay in place, but in general, state B, I mean, if we're in state A right now, which is not that well connected, very inwardly focused, uh, working with limited and poor data, state B is you've got access, real-time access, immediate access to the super set of data across your value chain at a detailed transactional level. And not only do you have real-time access to it, you can get to it anywhere. So it could be mobile, you're on your laptop, you, you know, you can call anybody in your organization or your network and get to the data. So it's data, it's ubiquitous. And when you're in that state, when it looks like that, all those metrics improve. You know, people talk about supply chain visibility, and we all know sort of intuitively it's good. You know, visibility equals good. That, that, that equation is sort of intuitive and we get it. But if you really drill into it, it's a very, very strong capability um, to acquire because it takes visibility to get to lower transportation spend and lower inventory levels. And that connection is often misunderstood. You know, I think we talked about data, we talked about getting into one place, and you talked about exceptions. It's really through visibility, which is not only seeing where inventory and shipments and orders are, but also layering on top of it the models that know where things ought to be. So in these repetitive supply chains where you know the cycle times between key gates, these models will pick up and show you and alert you when you're out of sync. And when you're doing that operationally, you end up catching exceptions sooner, correcting them, getting them back on track. And what you see in organizations is that their variability goes down. They actually reduce variability. And when you reduce variability, you reduce inventory. You know that that input to the inventory algorithm is changes. So you need less inventory because you can predict and trust that you're getting the in inventory you need. So these hard metrics become, um, they don't go away, they just get better in hyper-connected organizations. But I'd say the most important thing that happens is that you become flexible. You know, you become agile. And, you know, companies, business networks change. You change out suppliers, you change out service providers, you launch you know, you launch new markets, and you have to be fast and responsive, not just operationally, but in terms of opportunity. And that's what a hyper-connected network or the, the ability to get hyper-connected can give you. Instead of taking two years to get a full electronic order fulfillment system up and running in, you know, Eastern Europe, you're doing it in two months or three months. So we're talking about big, big shifts in how fast you can get operational and efficient when, you have, when you're a hyper-connected network. 
No, great point. I think it goes back to that point I made earlier in terms of, you know, again, the number one challenge I hear from supply chain executives is keeping up with that rapid pace of change. And I, I think, you know, you, you uh, kind of underscored that in terms of, you know, one of the key, you know, benefits that, that companies need to try to achieve in order to become, uh, you know, one of the key benefits of having a hyper-connected and, and synchronized uh, supply chains. Now, now, you work with a lot of, you know, manufacturers and retailers. Uh, I'm actually going to be heading out to a user conference next week, which I'm, I'm you know, looking forward to and, and being able to, to learn and network from, from some of your customers. Um, so when, when you look at you know, the, the, the manufacturers or retailers, the other companies you work with that, that have already embarked on this journey, uh, you know, this promise, you know, toward the promised land of, of hyper-connected and synchronized supply chains, what are some of the best practices or, or lessons learned you know, from those companies? Well, we've talked about one really important one in a way already, which is visibility first. You know, often, you know, we, we'll see a company that is embarking on a transformational journey and they may think of a, um, a super process, uh, procure to pay or um, origin operations or um, trade financing um, or better SNOP. But underpinning all these initiatives, we think, is that whole visibility framework and foundation. So the first thing we say, or the most sort of the, the most important thing to acknowledge and push is visibility first. And if you do that first, now that's, that's not always obvious. You know, I've seen a lot of maturity models and I've seen uh, companies that sort of subscribe, su subscribe to that notion of, well, you know what, we're going to tackle this process first. And over time, through that process, we're going to get the visibility we need. And it's true that there's a link. I mean, as you automate the procure-to-pay process, or you automate the order fulfillment process, or a receiving process, or a customer delivery process, you will embark on a visibility journey. But there are ways to emphasize and put a focus on data quality to get visibility right that will make everything else fly. So the first thing is visibility first. The second is, in the service of that, um, that, that mantra, is a a rigorous uh, approach to data quality. You know, you this does come down to working with partners to improve their data feeds. And no technology platform can solve that by itself. That take, it takes people and politics and movement to get it to work. And so, you know, we often say, and we see the best companies form a, a PMO, a, a, a program management office, where it's staffed by three, four, or five people that are expert level project managers around working with partners, providing data quality dashboards, working with other companies in the industry to kind of get data quality up. Um, but I would say that's a best practice for sure. Uh, emphasize data quality, don't undercut it, don't assume you can outsource that to um, the, your, the politics and the social work of it to, to any technology company or even a partner. That's gotta be, you know, that's gotta be a core competence. And last, I think, um, you know, the, some of what we've seen is that companies that are good at promoting what they do inside their companies, that you know, supply chain is still a mystery to a lot of folks. So if you, as a supply chain executive, get your team or bring in the competence to, uh, to communicate the plan, the destination, the vision, and then to be very, very um, crisp about how you communicate status and that story, that narrative, that story of A to B, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a best practice. I mean, I, I look at companies like uh, Pfizer, Jim Caffone over at Pfizer, who, and Tom France over at Caterpillar, both of whom I think have been really uh, sort of exceptional communicators about their company's supply chains and making um, it clear, not just to their, their people, but to their partners, their service providers and partners and suppliers, that this is a serious, game-changing, transformational initiative that they're embarking on. And then ultimately, that that kind of rolls right out through shareholders and the way the company is perceived. So again, I go back to you know, the best companies are going to be supply chain companies, and you need to communicate it. And so that communication is not going to necessarily come from a, a traditional PR department. It's got to come from supply chain executives, and they've got to be very, very good at it. Yeah, you, you raised the point about data quality management, and I, I com completely agree with that. I mean, I think um, you know, I think one of the challenges that have uh, companies have faced and one of the reasons why you know it's been such an issue uh, you know for first for so many years is that you know who owns data quality management right and I think that's not a clear answer at a lot of companies 
you know, there's, there's a lot of finger pointing that goes on, you know, operational people tend to say, well, that's IT's problem, right? IT needs to solve that. And IT says, no, 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 that's not us. You know, have your trading partner send us clean data and we will be all set, right? Or it's the assumption that, you know, it's everybody's responsibility, but there's no clear governance uh, or processes in place to how to do that. So I think that is, uh, I'm glad you brought that up because I, I firmly agree with, with that as well. And your last point, I think, answered in part my next question, which is, you know, there's so many competing projects and initiatives within companies. How do you, how do you get the CEO and CFO kind of on board? How do you get their buy-in, you know, for supply chain visibility and connectivity and synchronization? I mean, it, it sounds like for your last point that, you know, being able to tell that story kind of increases supply chain knowledge within internally is, is part of the answer. But uh, I don't want to put words in your mouth. So, so what's your take on that? I think every supply chain course that's taught today needs to, every supply chain program uh, as, as uh, you know, young professionals are coming up needs to include a communications dimension. I think that you know, supply chain executives today have to be like politicians. They have to be um, driven and focused on the vision, that end state, and they have to carry the message to the rest of their organization. You know, companies will not succeed, they will not win, they will not grow unless they're operationally excellent. And that's supply chain. So, you know, communications is a big part of that. And that may not be obvious to everybody. You know, this is, uh, but we're, you know, the times have changed, the world has changed, and now, if, um, if we're going to win, if companies are going to win, they not only have to be good operationally, they have to be good at talking about and communicating that they're good at it and why it's important. And they have to, they have to make the case and articulate to senior management. And I think we're going to see, we are seeing CEOs that are supply chain operational people. And so, um, you know, the, the profile of that supply chain executive is, 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 is going to change. And I think, you know, you can't drive change inside your company merely by being a good operational person. You've got to be a great, a great communicator. Yeah, great, great point. Uh, I think the other key point is that uh, I think it, it's somewhat obvious, but sometimes it, it falls through the cracks. Is that you really have to, at the end of the day, you know, be able to connect what you're doing in supply chain with the financial metrics that the CEO and CFO care about, right? So it's you know being able to point to what you're doing in supply chain to items on the balance sheet. And the you know the income statement and so forth because those are the metrics that you know they live and breathe by and if you're able to you know clearly communicate and demonstrate that link, uh, I think that helps uh, as well in terms of getting that buy-in you know from from senior management. Um, you know, Greg, we're kind of running out of, of time here, so let's just uh, get to the last question here, kind of as a way to wrap up. You know, what you know for anyone listening today, uh, either live or on demand. You know, what questions should companies ask themselves to assess their, you know, supply chain, you know, uh, training partner connectivity and, and, and visibility capabilities to determine whether they're, you know, best in class or not or whether they need improvement? And, and what's, what should be the first step they take to kind of uh, get closer to that promised land? Well, in, in some ways, I mean, I, I have a sort of a, a bias or a preference to metrics now that look not just at the performance levels we talked about, on time and full, and, and uh, inventory levels, and operational spend, but data metrics. And you know, one of the metrics that I talk about now quite a bit is real-time information access, you know, um, uh, what we call REOT, real-time information access time, the time that it takes to get to a specific piece of information. So for example, you could take any part of your executional network, look at um, one of the common ones in logistics, which is shipment status, the status of the shipment. You know, you basically have an identifier. It could be a, a bill of lading number or it could be a container number, or you might want to get to it through an order, an order number. But how long does it take you? I mean, if you take your best operators, put them in front of a laptop like we're in front of right now, Adrian, in front of our laptops, and take them through a series of random shipments in the network and track how fast they can get to accurate status and detailed status. And in our world, that response time should be less than 20 seconds. It should be less than 10 seconds. You know, and we have operators on our network, we have com companies, customers on our network that can get to detailed information about shipments, about inventory, about orders that quickly. And so we're at the beginning of, I think, another set of metrics 
which define how fast in a company and its operators can get to information quickly. And by the way, I don't mean just the operators. I, I, I mean executives. I mean, if you're an executive, pull out your phone right now and pull up the application on your iPhone or your Android that tells you where that hot order is and who it's going to and whether there's a problem with it. Or what are the five top exceptions in your network right now that are at risk? Do you have a crystal ball? And I think there's some intuitive stuff you can do right now to get a sense of how bad it is. And there are companies emerging that do a very good job of it. Um, so benchmarking and talking with other partners or peers in your network is a good way to get kind of a, an approximate sense. But you know there, there are some rigorous practices now emerging around RIOT and the time that it takes to get information. I think that's a great way to do a, a, a diagnostic. Do a, di a diagnostic as a next step across your network. And these can be fast. They don't have to be months. They're, they're, they're hours or days um, to determine just very quickly. It's a health check. How quickly can we get to the information we need anywhere around our, our value chain? And if you can't do that, then I doubt that you're really automating processes and driving value. Great, great advice. I, I, I love that, uh, you know, kind of taking that metric as a, uh, as a test or as an assessment tool to, to see where you're at. You know, as you were talking there in terms of time, um, you know, I think another metric that uh, might be worthwhile to look at that might be a little bit longer term to kind of investigate is, you know, time to resolution in terms of from a risk management standpoint. So whenever a supply chain disruption occurs within your, your network, how long does it take you to get back to normal? And I think a key part of being able to do that is having that visibility and having that advanced visibility to what's happening in your supply chain network so that you can take proactive action or once an event occurs, be able to resolve it as quickly as possible. So I think that's another metric that I like to talk about and think about from more from a risk management angle. Um, but, but I think that's also a, a key area where you know, these types of platforms you know, can have a, a very important role. In. And certainly risk management is something that's becoming much more uh, important and getting higher visibility within the C-suite at companies as well. So, Greg, you know, as always, you know, when we do these programs, we, we manage just to scratch the surface uh, on this topic, but we, we definitely, I think, uh, address a lot of key points. Uh, I'm sure that I'll, uh, next week uh, I'll come back with a, a lot of great ideas and, and insights from some of your customers and, and the presentations I'll see there. But um, uh, certainly it's a topic that we'll continue to, you know, write about and talk about here uh, I'm talking logistics uh, in, the, in the weeks and months ahead. So thank you very much for taking time today to, to be with us. Thank you for including me, Adrian. I look forward to seeing you at Bridges next week. Great. And for those of you that are watching uh, this on demand, if you do have a question for Greg, uh, you can find the episode on TalkingLogistics.com. Uh, you can go ahead and post a, a question or comment there, and I'm sure Greg would be happy to, to respond via that platform as well. So again, thank you all for joining us today, and look forward to seeing a future episode of Talking Logistics. Have a great day.